I, I'm an engineer because I like problem solving. <laughs> There's a lot of job satisfaction. You see things being built. I've worked on jobs through my career that are still there, for bridges, and you go back and you look at them and you think, I was part of that. I think engineers do just as much to, to shape our society than perhaps more obvious professions like the medics and whatnot. I think engineers have contributed more to public health in the last couple of centuries than they have, for example. It's, it's the work that we do isn't really noticed by people. And I guess maybe we like it that way, but every now and again you get a chance to really showcase what we've done, which is, there it is behind me. So as a civil engineer, I've been involved in numerous interesting projects, including um, lots of aerial photography across Scotland, hanging out with helicopters, um, travelling to exotic places such as Hong Kong and meeting many different people. Uh... Another day at the office. Well, what we've got actually in terms of the completed project is, is quite a, is a much more discreet solution if you like, in terms of, uh, you know, you can travel through it quite quickly and actually remember what it was before in terms of, you know, the, the time you would spend in the traffic lights. It's a quite a good exemplar in terms of, you know, a trunk road improvement that's really kind of dealt with, you know, bespoke set of circumstances. In the park we have uh, four trunk roads going through the park, so the National Park at the Holman Trossachs is right close to Glasgow and so every, all the traffic moving north and west goes through the park. So a great opportunity there to improve, greatly needed as well and so the Pulpit Rock project has, has been very welcome uh, in addressing a long-standing kind of choke in the network. Key things is how, how the improvement, how it sat within the landscape in that area. So we really needed a bespoke solution to that so we give feedback just in terms of how that would work, how the, how the access to it in terms of actually implementing uh, the scheme would work as well and so that it was done in a way which like all development in the park does relate to exactly the local uh, landscape but also within the context because places like that you can see it from the high ground, the Monroes around the area. You know this project demonstrates through what can be achieved through collaboration so there has been you know, as planners we need to understand what the engineering challenges are and from an engineering point of view they need to understand the wider context and the wider considerations with where their engineering is going. So I think it's, I think it's a very positive example. Uh, well this scheme covers the emergency response at Lamington Viaduct. So on New Year's Eve of 2015 uh, there was a report from a train driver that the structure was moving as his train passed over it. So the line was immediately shut uh, for safety purposes and then we mobilised a full team of contractors and designers on New Year's Day at First Light to visit the structure to ascertain the damage. Uh, the River Clyde had uh, risen by over 1.2 metres. Uh, well, the first stage I'd say, was to stabilise the structure, so that meant damming off part of the River Clyde to prevent water from flowing under the affected part of the bridge. And from that we were then able to pump concrete uh, underneath the foundation that had been washed away and that then stabilised the structure sufficiently that we could allow people to go onto the structure and underneath it to further examine it. And from there we were able to start uh, designing a long-term solution. Uh, well, the West Coast Main Line at that location takes over 150 trains a day as a, as a main route between Glasgow and Edinburgh. So to put that structure out of commission for any period of time would have caused massive disruption to both passenger traffic and also to freight traffic throughout Scotland and the UK. So the only viable quick solution was to repair the structure in situ and uh, also at one stage we, our compound was directly next to the bridge and that was uh, washed away at one point. Around you just now is a beautiful garden, beautiful green space for the city to be used by the people of the city. It's really um, difficult to imagine that this was in effect in the middle of an urban motorway until the last two or three years. So we've gone from a heavily trafficked area, 30,000 vehicles moving through this area under the old urban motorway, as we used to call it, to this now beautifully designed public space. So it's been quite a dramatic transformation. More recently we had the Urwilly Bucket Trail and it was packed with people here and that's what we want to see more of. So evidence of 
the investment that we're trying to attract is actually already emerging around us. So off to my left is the, the new v &A Museum, which will open in the middle of 2018. It's the new rail station, which will open in autumn of 2017. It, it's really interesting that what this project has done is reconnect the city with the river. It was a fantastic opportunity to be involved in something that the whole country, if not world, was looking at, which made it a huge challenge um, and a huge privilege to be part of the team that repaired that and got it back up and running again. Um, we went down and had a look at the, the truss end link, which is the part that it failed. Uh, there was a pin that allows the, the truss to move. The traffic going over the bridge causes the truss to move and that's, that's expected, that's part of the design of the bridge. And the pin that allows that movement had seized, causing a fracture in the truss end link. That fracture was repaired with a splint and the bottom was uh, pushed up using a hydraulic jack. It was uh, vital to use social media to get to keep the public informed and make sure that they were uh, on board with with what was happening. Um, the weather, obviously, with it being an emergency repair, usually when we were working on the bridge, we'd be planning these for the the summer months. And um, the emergency repair, we weren't obviously able to do that, so we were uh, battling the elements. Once we'd done it, we put on some very, very high-tech structural health monitoring, which is the most sophisticated, probably, on any bridge in the UK. One free fish pass in Culvert not only addressed the infrastructure resilience issues, but has also created a fish pass that will allow salmon to access the habitat upstream of the railway line. See, the, the design of the fish pass was an innovative design um, that has not only created a fish pass, but it's created in-stream habitat too. There's pool features there that fish can rest and hold in as they're heading upstream, but there's also in-stream habitat there. There's, there's materials that build up in the steps on the fish pass, and that provides habitat for juvenile fish and spawning area for adult salmon that are returning to, to reproduce. The local community would have been unaware of the fish passage issues, but during the, the, the consultation design and, and then subsequently the, the installation of the fish pass, there have been an awareness raising in the area about the fact that salmon can now access habitat that they've been unable to since the late 1980s. So. What we've really noticed with Guruk is that there's been a massive change in the number of people visiting. Um, we're finding the footfalls much higher. We're finding that lots of people are coming from out of town to enjoy the shops, all the independent shops that are here. Lots of public space that's been created by the regeneration. They've managed to find places where they can sit and enjoy the outstanding views that we have in Guruk. Well, when we had the regeneration, it was quite challenging and difficult for us. Um, obviously as retailers the footfall had dropped. Obviously when it's a huge job like that it's going to have its, its challenges but we found that there was a liaison officer who visited every week that we knew that we could contact and we also knew that we had the contacts up at Riverside and Berkeley if there were any issues. When they were doing the work there was lots of work changed to the pavement. We were told when that work was going to take place and we were able to do it at maybe our quieter times or even if it meant closing our shops for a short period of time, they worked really fast and, and really well. Lots of parking for them to find in Guruk as well. Um, the traffic's much better. We're able to get deliveries. Um, they can stop outside, which could never happen before. What we did was we took out boulder bank protection which was put in in the 1990s to stop the river from meandering and from eroding into the stream. When we worked with civil engineers, it was, it was a really unique project for them because we wanted to take out the engineered part of the river. Normally, when engineers work on a river or work on a project, they're putting something in. And the big thing here is we wanted to remove boulders, we wanted to get the river back to as natural a state as possible, we wanted to put the boulders back on the bottom of the hillside where they came from initially, and we wanted to cause 
the least uh, disruption to the sensitive habitat as possible. The River South Esk has got one of the most important freshwater pearl mussel populations in Scotland. Freshwater pearl mussels need a really, really clean, well oxygenated river to live in, but one of the additional benefits of having freshwater pearl mussels in your river is that they clean it for you. An adult mussel will filter around 50 litres of water a day because they're filter feeders. They live for a very, very long time. They can live for 80 to 100 years old. And this means that in a lifetime, they can filter up to a million litres of water. The amount of water that a person would use in 17 years. So one mussel is supplying a person with 17 years worth of fresh, clean water. And that would cost Scottish water at the moment around three and a half thousand pounds uh, to do. So that's one mussel. When you've got a population of a million mussels, that's value for money. built widened the lossy through Elgin uh, to allow it to take the water through. We've built bridges, retaining walls, this sort of thing. And then laterally we managed to add on a cycleway along the embankment, the flood embankment, which provides a safe facility for walking and cycling right the way across Elgin without having to go on the roads. The flood scheme alone created this opportunity and it's a very scenic, attractive route that's caught the public's attention and it's been very well used. We had a close event, quite a, quite a bad rain event, uh, some 18 months ago, where the scheme was about 95% complete. And apart from a couple of little bits where we had to rush and sandbag, the scheme held. And that was when it was 95%. So it's now provided protection for a few hundred properties in Elgin, commercial and uh, residential. You know, we've got some iconic structures built now uh, in Elgin and uh, I think most people in Elgin feel relieved that they're now protected from flooding of the River Lossing. I'm delighted to talk to you today about the Sea Braes pedestrian and cycle bridge here in Dundee. The new bridge cuts an almost mile long detour around the railway line, which previously separated the waterfront from the west of the city. In fact, it was amazing to see the bridge being lifted in one piece uh, over the railway line. In my view, the design of the bridge is contemporary and clean, but it's also eye-catching and practical. The lift means it can also be used by those with mobility problems. Improved pedestrian access to the waterfront was a key issue when there were consultations over the waterfront master plan. And Dundee is continuing to improve its infrastructure and that includes improvement of the green circular route around the city. The new bridge sits alongside the route and provides a fantastic view across the River Tay to Fife. As MP for Dundee West, I'm very proud that we have another iconic structure to add to the growing list in our town. Now time me to Taipong Po Tunnels in Hong Kong consisted of 2.6 kilometres of drill and blast tunnels consisting of 12 different tunnel profiles. The design of all of the temporary support and permanent support for these tunnels was carried out in our Glasgow office. As part of that process, we had to prepare technical reports and drawings, and we also identified at that stage that there was potential for value engineering savings to be introduced to the project. We put together an alternative for the location of the cavern within the project, which was to move that towards the north end of the project and reduce the length of tall vent tunnels. After the successful award of the contract, uh, we had to mobilise quickly in Glasgow to start the design works and this involved a number of trips at the very outset to Hong Kong and it also involved the, the Glasgow office uh, changing working hours to align more with Hong Kong which is between seven and eight hours ahead of us. The project was challenging from the perspective that we were now dealing with a client who is uh, different culturally, um, very, very different parties and government departments as well who have very strict uh, requirements in Hong Kong which are different from what we normally do on a day-to-day -day basis in Scotland. So it's been a challenging project to, uh, um, through the use of technology, we prepared many 3D models uh, that we could present to them from a distance and, and have conference calls to take it forward. Um, the, the project as a whole has allowed myself and the team to develop a number of skills that we didn't have previously and it's allowed us to innovate on both this project and other projects that we've done since. 
so we're working within a tunnel, it's only circa 12, 12 metres across and 8 metres high, so that gave us a constraint in the type of plant we could use within the tunnel. We're in a cutting either side, so there was no immediate access to the site. We're quite, it was quite uh, remote from any access point. Okay, there's kind of two parts to the solution. Uh, one was putting in a slab track, which basically reduced the construction depth of the track, of the track formation. So that bought us some, bought us from height advantage. And we also installed a conductor bar, a conductor beam in the top of the tunnel, which reduces, reduces the height of the conductor equipment required. So basically by a combination of both, uh, stealing some height at the top and, and at the bottom, uh, we managed to get the, the electric trains to fit through the existing uh, tunnel infrastructure. Okay, conductor bars not the first. There's a few within tunnels in the UK, but putting this sort of modular slab track, this was the first of its type to be in a main line in the UK. So it's extensively used in the continent, but this was the first time it had been used in a, in a main line in UK railways. Okay, what it enables is electric trains to travel between Edinburgh and Glasgow, ultimately. Uh, there's a few tunnels, but by putting the slab track system here and the overhead line conductor bar system, that will, that will allow electric trains to uh, travel between Glasgow and Edinburgh.